Mr. President. Mr. Speaker. Senator Kelly. Representative Candelora. Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz. Members of the General Assembly. Thank you for inviting me back to the room where it happens four years later and what a four years it has been. All right, every election gives us a fresh start, starting with 36 new legislators. We have a freshly admitted Secretary of State, Thomas. We have our first... We have our first millennial constitutional officers, Controller Scanlon and Treasurer Russell. <laughs> Unlike Washington, we have a Speaker of the House. <laughs> Speaker of the House Ritters at the ripe old age of 40. So, not to worry, Kevin and Marty and I are hanging around, chaperone this party just a little bit longer. All right, thanks for the birthday greetings. I did turn 69 yesterday. All right, so time marches on. <laughs> Feel like I better hurry up. Maybe I'm a little less guarded. A little more blunt, and I'm feeling a little more urgency to get the yes. Also, tell you, getting older is kind of liberating, you know. And I don't want you guys to have to wait a generation until you feel equally liberated. Look, when I was, when I turned 18, Richard Nixon was president. My friends and I were listening to the transistor radio, the lottery, who's going to get drafted off to Vietnam, and um, I have been a Democrat ever since. But even in public life, we're so much more than our party affiliation. My defining professional experience was starting a telecom company, operating that, watching my amazing wife. Where's my amazing wife? Watching my amazing wife um, invest in great entrepreneurs. So I'm a proud husband, I'm a very proud dad, and sort of an up and down Yankees fan. <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I got you going. Um, so I want you all to remember, this is a citizen legislature. And I get it, the Republicans are generally over here and the Democrats are over there and you have caucuses and you have leaders. But you're also much more than that. You're bringing different experiences and backgrounds to the table. And we're all much better for it. You know, perhaps you ran for office because you wanted to fix something that ticked you off. Maybe you're a teacher or a coach or business, labor, community volunteer. I don't know what inspired you. But I urge you, at the end of that hearing, grab a beer or a cup of coffee with that member to your left or right. See what you have in common and listen for what you don't have in common. Or maybe you're here because you're just proud to be an American citizen serving in our democracy. What's the matter with that? We have four new legislators who are not born in the United States of America. Senator M.D. Rahman from Bangladesh. Where's M.D.? There you are, an amazing entrepreneur. Joe Hoxha from Albania. There you are. Hey, Joe, tell Dua Lipa how cool Connecticut is, will you? Hector Arzano from Argentina. Rachel Khanna from France. They're neighbors in Greenwich and little France, little Argentina. I'd love to hear those World Cup squabbles as they do the long commute up to Hartford. But more importantly, 
whether you're born in Argentina or France or Bangladesh or Albania, thank you for making Connecticut your home. And that's not woke, that's America. Thank you. While I'm at it, I want to give a special shout out to Sarah. She's a student at Gateway Community College. She hails from Afghanistan, where the Taliban no longer allow girls to go to college. Sarah, Gateway Community, if the Taliban doesn't welcome you back to Afghanistan, you always have a home right here in Connecticut. These are Connecticut values. These are Connecticut values. All right, everybody together. Let's show how much we can get done by working together, demonstrating how our differences is what brings us together, not tears us apart. All right, so four years ago, the elephant in the room was, quote, a permanent fiscal crisis. Remember that? At the time, okay, I got a little riled up, but I said, let's fix the damn budget once and for all. In that first year, we didn't permanently fix it. But we made a significant first step together towards fixing it. We delivered a balanced budget on time without relying on the tax increases, which had become the historic norm. And just as we were beginning to feel that momentum, COVID hit, and it hit our region hard. I love uh, John Lennon, and I know he's saying imagine. He also said, life was what happens while you're busy making other plans. Life was what happens while you're busy making other plans. And nobody had a plan for COVID. I knew what I didn't know, and I knew how to reach out to people who did. We reached out to the hospitals, the epidemiologists, business, labor, faith leaders, asking how can we keep our community safe and how can we get our economy open safely? And I want to say special thanks to each and every one of you. You have such credibility in your communities. You helped make sure that we were all speaking with one voice, that we rode together, rowing in the same direction. And I really believe that that helped Connecticut heal and heal faster. So in those early months, Government was all about lifelines and rescue operations, be it masks or tests or more cash assistance for the unemployed or for essential workers or for families with kids, plus direct payments to keep our small businesses open. Well, three years later, I still worry like heck about COVID, but I worry even more that we will lose the opportunity as a state and as a country to lift families up. So the next four years should focus more on recovery and less on rescue, less need for lifelines, and more focus on ladders. Keep our economy groping, making sure that growth means a ladder to opportunity for everyone, regardless of background, regardless of zip code. That's what Connecticut's all about. <laughs> Doug McQuarrie, wake up, Doug. Always likes to remind me, he likes to remind me that talent is widely distributed, but opportunity not so much. Well, my fiscal priorities are economic growth because growth is the precondition to economic opportunity. We have 100,000 jobs right now going begging in our state. Why is that? One, a smaller share of our workforce of working age is working. Two, our population is growing, but it's growing too slowly. And three, many of these unfilled jobs require extra training. All right, so what are we gonna do about that? We've done a lot together. 
or making it easier for people to get back to work. A workplace that meets the needs of a young family, paid family and medical leave, expanded childcare, paid sick days. These initiatives help young families get back to work and stay at work. Two, we've got a minimum wage that keeps pace with inflation. Work should pay more, and we're providing you the skills you need to take that higher paying next job. Career Connect will set you up with the skills and virtually a guaranteed job, which is your next rung on the ladder to opportunity. And that new job is the start of a career, and that career may give you the experience and the confidence to start your own business. So thank you for passing the Small Business Boost Fund that has invested so far in over 100 new and expanding companies. 100. And most of these businesses are led by women and entrepreneurs of color right in the community. Look, I spent 30 years in business and I see opportunity through a lens of starting small businesses and helping them grow. But innovation doesn't begin and end in the private sector. And I want all of our commissioners and state employees to be empowered to innovate as well. We rely too much on subsidies instead of innovation to provide better service at less cost. In my office, our team has heard me say over and over, stop pouring money into a leaky bucket. Fix the bucket and put the money to work. We can keep spending hundreds of millions of dollars to patch up those old bridges where the trains and the trucks have to slow down to cross safely, or we can rebuild the choke points in our transportation system to help you get to and from work faster and safer. Look, I'm headed off to New London in about 10 minutes to meet Secretary of Transportation Buttigieg, the band formerly known as Mayor Pete. They awarded a big grant to four states. Connecticut was one of the four states. A $158 million grant to Connecticut to rebuild the old Gold Star Bridge. Rebuild it. That's what I call structural reform. And we still have $1 billion, almost $1 billion, in federal money right now to invest in education. Thank you, Secretary Cardona. President Biden stole him away, but he'll be back. <laughs> and he knows all too well that education is that ladder to opportunity. So I urge all of our superintendents and principals and teachers, we've got the resources. Let's implement your best ideas to help students recover from learning loss. Let's get them loving to learn again with apprentice and career opportunities to put them on the path to success. All right. We have high health care costs, high energy costs, high housing costs, but the answer can't always be more subsidies or bailouts. The taxpayers can't afford it, and too often a subsidy is an excuse for no structural reform. Deirdre Gifford and her health care cabinet will continue to make health care more accessible and more affordable. And I love the recently announced partnership between UConn and Connecticut Innovations and Hartford HealthCare to jointly identify and invest in the next generation of healthcare companies and life-saving treatments. Come on, insurance companies. Don't just pass along those hospital and pharma costs. Let's reward patients and companies who seek treatment where they get the best quality and the best value. And come on, electric companies, don't just tell me you're passing along those high natural gas prices at the ratepayer. Oh, and can you subsidize it just a little bit more? Let's get together. We've already got control over our energy supply. So Putin and the Saudis don't have control over our destiny and our wallets. We've made a good start, thanks to you, by expanding our wind power, extending our nuclear power, pushing hard to get access to Quebec Hydro, and making our homes more efficient. 
That's less cost and carbon free. But the biggest slam in our beautiful state to affordability and economic growth is housing, or the lack thereof. Every business thinking about moving or expanding repeats to me over and over again, even if I have the workforce, there's no place for them to live. And the answer can't simply be more subsidies. Connecticut towns and cities, here's the deal. You tell us where developers can build more housing. Tell us where you want to build. It could be built faster, built at less cost, pre-zoned, and local control will determine how and where it is built. What do you think, Sayla? <laughs> That's our future. Our future is more local businesses, more housing options in your downtown, walk to work, or take public, faster public transit. And you know what that means? And you've heard me say it over and over again. I don't want more taxes, but I don't mind more taxpayers. More taxpayers guarantee a bigger economic pie that lets us keep the progress in progressive. The next generation in Connecticut is all about opportunity. And that opportunity starts with economic growth. Fiscal stability is the foundation to inclusive growth. In 2017, the legislature put in place the fiscal guardrails that have allowed us to honestly balance our budget four years in a row. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Along the way, we paid down billions in pension debt, which our predecessors had put on the uh, state's credit card. And we're honoring our commitments to teachers and state employees, reducing costs to taxpayers for the next generation. And we still have a long way to go. It also means that thanks to our collective efforts, the era of Connecticut's permanent fiscal crisis is over. It's over. It's over. It's over as long as we maintain the same fiscal discipline that served us so well over the last four years. And after many years of unfilled promises, now is the time to enact a meaningful middle-class tax cut. A meaningful tax cut. It's a reduction in tax rates which, take, which the state can afford and makes your life more affordable. All right, so Connecticut is moving from rescue to recovery, investing in our future, in your future, starting with good paying jobs and allowing you to keep more of what you earn. So on election night, I was looking at Steve Karnacki's election maps, remember, and saw the red was getting redder and the blue was getting bluer. I think here in Connecticut was a little different. It's not every day that New Canaan and New Britain vote the same way. <laughs> that the suburbs and the cities are complementary, not competitive. It's a sign that Connecticut is working together as one. Take notice, Washington. So, if you make it over to the inaugural bash this evening, why don't you go to a party like a liberated governor just had a birthday? Let your hair down. <laughs> I want to see a little foot loose on the dance floor. <laughs> maybe with somebody you don't know, but you maybe see around the building every once in a while you want to get to know. And uh, I did this four years ago. Thank you for the opportunity to do it again. But after the inaugural four years ago, I did get about 10,000 tweets saying, Governor, never dance in public again. <laughs> 
but it's my party. I'll dance if I want to. God bless the dancing state of Connecticut. The dancing state of Connecticut.